I would like to thank all of you uh, for spending your time for this talk, to be here this morning, and especially Professor Sand, who has organized this. I didn't come for a political visit, I visited Washington. But I appreciate that Dr. Asano decided that we should share ideas and share some views. I won't make a lecture. I can't lecture to professors. I won't make a speech, but uh, just give a talk on some ideas and views, and then have a discussion. The talk will have uh, five parts. First, a general introduction on how I have tentatively subdivided Sub-Saharan Africa political history and phases. On the second part, we'll try to discuss about uh, trends, <coughs> challenges, and dilemmas in Sub-Saharan Africa. The third part is Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is subdivided in four different sub-regions. Then I'll try to make a kind of uh, outlook on each one of the sub-regions. And then finally, make some remarks on Angola. As well as introduction, I have tentatively divided um, Sub-Saharan Africa political history in five different phases. The first phase is pre-colonial Africa, whose general characteristics were the global trend of backwardness. The second phase is colonial Africa, starting from around 1400. And the general characteristics were disruption, because the normal trend and evolution of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa political study story was disrupted, slave trade, and exploitation. And then we have post-colonial independence era, 60s, generally. This was characterized by euphoria first, and then substitution, and then uncertainty. Euphoria because everyone believed that it was a moment for African countries to emerge in the global scene. But then general characteristic also was substitution. Most of the leaders of that phase just assumed the same behavior as the colonialists which brought about uncertainty. The fourth phase can be considered as starting after the global democratic revolution in the 1980s, 1989 and 1990. And in Africa, it was characterized both by change and metamorphosis. What I mean, we have some countries where there was real change as far as values, principles of democracy, governance, and political systems. But in some countries, what has happened is just metamorphosis. The same political actors who believed in one part systems, Marxist-Leninist systems, and so on, as the global change happened, they just adopted a new language, a new behavior, but not the values and the principles. So there was not really change. In some countries, yes, there was change. In other countries, it was only metamorphosis. And the last phase is, which starts by the year 2000, which is characterized by revival, by greater hope in some countries, but occasional despair, like what we have now in Central African Republic, for instance. Then those are tentatively what I consider the five phases of the Af Sub-Saharan Africa political history. Current trends, challenges, and dilemmas. First challenge, how can we solve the dilemma of having regimes which consider power as an end in itself, meaning they are there just for the sake of power, or have a vision of building something? That's the first great dilemma of Africa. Most of those who are ruling, they are there for the sake of power, but not building something. Second dilemma is the problem of liberators versus builders. 
Meaning that those regimes, which were the ones that fought for independence and got power, they behave as owners of the country, owners of the peoples. Because they feel, okay, we have liberated you. We can give you independence. Then we own you. We own the country. And on the other side, we have regimes that have overcome that phase. They are, they are not the liberators, and they have to build their own image by building something, building societies. Another dilemma we have in Sub-Saharan Africa is the problem of, are you trying to build countries value-based or objective-driven? And uh, in most circumstances, people tend to give more priority on trying to set objectives instead of creating societies based on values, specific values. That this is also a great dilemma in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have something interesting also in Sub-Saharan Africa, is that we have those countries with high economic potential are the weaker achievers as far as indicators of human development. Examples are Angola, Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, for instance. Countries with weak economic potential are high achievers as far as indicators of human development. Examples are Cape Verde, for instance, Mauritius, for instance, or even Ghana. Then, why those that have the potential are weak achievers and those that have not the potential are high achievers? It's a great idea. We have the problem on, and that problem has been also filled by international uh, attitudes, which is, should we base our country's stability on strong chiefs, or should we base the stability of our countries in strong functioning institutions? The tendency international has been to put more value on strong chiefs, like the Kagames, like the Museveni's, like the Dos Santos, instead of putting more importance on those countries that have succeeded to build institutions, and then the stability and evolution of the country is based on institutions, functioning institutions. Those are what I consider the challenges and dilemmas which Unless the regimes and societies address them correctly, the tendency will be to go on negatively. <coughs> as far as the regional outlook, the first region is West Africa, mostly this area here. This is a diverse and a dynamic region. We have the viable states and some with the risk of failing states like at this moment uh, Mali for instance it was necessary for France to intervene to guarantee that the state continues to be a state it's the most integrated region as far as free circulation of people and goods and have the same, same single currency uh, most of the, the region excluding Nigeria it's a, re a region of weak economic potential, excluding Nigeria. And uh, it's a region where also there is strong international or foreign interference, especially France. In most of the countries in this region, France has troops and bases and so on. And unless those regimes and those countries deal correctly with the interests of France, the risk of interventions are very high in this region. Central Africa is more or less here. It's a least viable region of Africa. It's a region with weak democratic credentials. It's dominated by intra and interstate conflicts in the Congos, in Central African Republic, 
Rwanda, Burundi, many conflicts around intra and interstate conflicts. Excluding the Republic Democratic of Congo is a region of weak economic potential and combines also viable and failing states, risk of failing states, especially Central Africa Republic. Eastern Africa, it's the real, this region. It's a challenging region, combines also viable states under the most failed state in Africa, which is Somalia. It has an acceptable economic revival process. Uganda, Kenya, uh, coming up. Uh, it has a strong economic potential and uh, it's moving also slowly but gaining some democratic credentials. Southern Africa, which I consider the most viable region of Sub-Saharan Africa. Most of the countries with the exception of Congo, Angola, and uh, Zimbabwe, most of the countries have achieved the positive democratic relations, particularly Zambia, particularly Namibia, Botswana. It's a, a region with strong economic potential and also has a process of growing integration as far as the movement of people, goods, and their finances. These are more or less what I could say is the outlook of the four sub-Saharan African regions, sub-regions. Let's move to Angola. Finally, after decades of war, we have peace. We have peace which allowed what I call renaissance of Angola, the moment to restart. And also, the end of war has liberated the individual as a human being. We have the challenge of stability, stability. Because people tend to prefer the school which considers that is a strong chief that guarantees stability. And in Angola, that strong chief is Mr. Dos Santos. While we do believe that the better option should be to build strong and functional institutions so that by the day he is no longer there, the state continues to function. And uh, my personal view is that also what we have in Angola fits into the characteristic of metamorphosis. As long as Mr. Dos Santos is the president of Angola, there will not be in Angola reforms, positive reforms, as far as democracy, as far as the governing quality, as good governance, as far as values, as far as principles. They won't be. Because of that reason is why we have been trying to, to, to build institutions so that we don't fall this problem of strong chiefs. The democratic process in Angola started in 1991 after years of one-party system and Marxist-Leninist, but it stalled in 1992 due to resumption of war and stagnated. We reinitiated only after peace in 2002. So, in Angola, we have some of the values of democracy present, but some not present. So we call that, we consider that Angola is a country in transition to democracy, not yet a fully democratic country. As far as the rule of law, it's a strong problem, a big problem, because uh, the ruling governing party considers the implementation of laws and regulations according to every specific interest, meaning the same law can be interpreted on one direction according to the interest or in another direction. And what we saw is that the institutions are the most, are the, are the, are the ones that violated the most the laws. Then, we don't consider that we have rule of law assured in Angola. Quality of governance, very bad. 
high mismanagement, rampant corruption, especially at the, the top level, nepotism. If one sees today the regime, the vice president of the country is a cousin of the president. The minister of finance is the nephew of the president. The, the CEO of the sovereign fund is the son of the president. And the daughter of the president is the richest person, is the richest woman in Africa, and the richest Angola. Then the quality of governance is, 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 is more or less characterized by mismanagement, corruption, and uh, strong, uh, how do I say, lack of interest as far as service delivery to the citizens. Economic situation. Angola has growth during 10 years tenfold. Meaning, in 2002, when we achieved peace, the GDP of the country was about $12 billion. 10 years later, the GDP moved to $127 billion. Uh, and the growth, has possibility to continue at least for more two or three decades in strong levels. This year we expect the growth to be about 7-8%. After having growth for 12, 11, 13% in the previous years before the international financial crisis. Most of the economy is still dominated by the oil sector. We produce now about 2 million barrels a day and we expect by next year to be around 2.3 million, and in 10 years probably reach 3 million barrels a day. Diamonds are part of the, 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 the strong sectors, other mining sectors also strong, agriculture very weak, uh, tourism inexistent, then this is more or less the characteristics of the economy. Social environment. The main characteristic of our social condition is poverty. Almost half of the population is completely poor. There is a positive evolution that in the last 10 years, it's, we are having a, a small, mid, uh, I would say, middle class evolving. It's true that the middle class is mostly civil servants, top officers of the army and the police and some business people. But it, 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 it's growing, but the main characteristic is poverty. Lately, because of the debacle that we had in Cote d'Ivoire, and also in Guinea-Bissau, Guinea -Bissau, the regime has decided to downscale this tendency of intervention. But unfortunately, the international community considers Mr. Santos as a kind of stabilizer militarily in the region. In the region. One of the bigger challenges for Angola is how to establish a kind of better partnership between Angola and South Africa. The tendency is in Angola to consider that we are uh, competing rivals, while I do believe that if we could find a way of really structuring a uh, strategic partnership, it could be good for the region. How do I see relations between the United States and South Africa? Which I consider that the best thing should be to go beyond the past. Before the uh, 1989 global revolution, democratic revolution, the role of the U.S. was intervention. The U.S. was supporting UNETA and the Soviet Union, the government, for decades. Uh, all of us used to have training from here, uh, as I'm also a retired general. After 1989, the relationship was dominated by oil dynamics. Most uh, uh, oil sector is dominated by Chevron, Texaco, 
and then BP and Total. Then the dynamics of oil are the ones that dominated the nature of the relationship between the United States and the world. Now that the US is moving to self-sufficiency in terms of oil, this has become less important. When I talk to US officials, and uh, Mr. Kerry hopefully was there in Angola last week, two weeks ago, what I've been saying is the relationship should be dominated by EEI, engage, encourage, and invest. Engage in terms of institutions from the U.S., senators, congressmen, institutions from Angola engage each other to understand better and to forge a new relationship. Encourage, because we do believe that the U.S. needs to encourage Angolan institutions to adhere to democratic values and principles and also move to better governance, good governance, and invest. We have been telling the U.S. officials that investment from the U.S. should go beyond the oil sector. Probably other mining sectors, or infrastructure, and so on, other sectors. That should really be the dynamic of the relationship, but we expect that uh, this can happen one day. That this is what I want to talk about, and I'm open for questions. Any questions? Uh, can you give us an idea? Of, my name is Doji, Doji Goli. Um, I'm from Togo, West Africa. Uh, and I watched the, the Argonian uh, conflict very closely. Uh, I heard of Angola's involvement, but I couldn't see any actual evidence of the involvement of Angola in Ivory Coast. So I don't know if you can give us an idea if there is any involvement, how it was, and you know how come we could see it or what was happening. During the war in Angola, Ivory Coast was on the side of UNITA and Savimbi. When President Bwani died, after some time, also conflict started in Ivory Coast. By the time Dushantush succeeded to kill Sabimbi and end the war in Angola. Dushantush decided to revenge the situation in Cote d'Ivoire. What Dushantush wanted is no one from the previous regime should be on top. That's why they supported uh, Mr. Babo. We had there some troops, not really very much, but we had there some troops mostly for the security of Mr. Babo. And when France intervened, we had to negotiate with France so that the, those elements of our troops that were in Ivory Coast could return. What Mr. Dushnach did not understand is that he was overstretching. West Africa is too far and not part of the really geopolitical interests of Angola. And that was the reason. On the uh, economic front, you had indicated uh, the need to encourage and invest. What are the um, emerging, emerging uh, industries that you guys are having other than the oil and diamond, which dominate? Yes, we encourage investment. Though we recognize that uh, the business environment in Angola is not necessarily friendly, but has a potential of high yield. It's not friendly, but has a high potential in terms of, uh, I would say, the yield. Then, what we have been suggesting to U.S. officials is that, yes, let's go beyond oil. We have other minerals, other mining sectors, many, plenty, plenty of them. We have infrastructure. For instance, the construction business is dominated by Chinese and Brazilians. Why not build construction companies from the U.S. to build dams, to build roads, to build bridges, and so on? They are not there. Uh, the financial sector is dominated by Portugal. Why Portugal? That has no potential really to make it work. Why not the American banks there? And also several other factors, for instance, hotels. Why not the Marriott? Why not the Hilton? Why not the is dominated by just Brazilians and Portugal. 
that those are the sectors that we do consider that the US companies and the business people would have an interest and move on. I'm from Tanzania. Um, for the past four years I've been here studying. I, I normally hear some of the uh, politicians from our country, but also now I can hear most of the African politicians they do, they do normally get on platforms that talking about, okay, come to our country, invest, but for me, that argument, I wouldn't agree with it. What do you have on the table? A strategic outline to make a person be interested to invest in your country. That's a big challenge for most of the politicians. Normally, they, they will be talking on the uh, outside framework, but when you go inside, see what things are just going on, Knowing a person who can take his own money and turn it into a wasted thing. In your speech, I didn't hear exactly what really do you have. The outline, you might not have a big document there, but the outline to make a person, okay, if I go there to invest, our relationship is going to be better because some of these investors, all the countries which are supporting our countries also, they do run away because they are capable of supporting, but when they start, the relationship which emerges is very bad. In terms of corruption, whatever, mismanagement as you are talking. So we should have something on the table, really, which by itself could attract investors, not by you talking. As I told, uh, as I said in the beginning, I didn't come for a political visit. I just came for the graduation of my son. And when I was invited, I said, okay, let me just put on some points for a talk. As I said, I visited Washington last year in a tour that I went to Lisbon, Paris, London, and Washington. That was a political mission. As I said also, the business environment in Angola is not yet friendly <coughs> because of corruption, because of too much uh, bureaucracy, uh, backlogs, and so on. It's not necessarily friendly. But I recognize also that the government, the current government, has been trying. They have set up a kind of a foreign investment institution to help and regulate things. They are trying to reduce the bureaucratic environment, but one of the big problems is corruption. As I said, the business environment is not friendly, but the, the yield on investment is very high. That's what really makes the situation different. But is the, I think that the government has, has regulations, has laws who, that really are available for everyone to see. So um, I'm from Americas. Um, so I'm wondering, is, uh, my understanding is that you're in your position. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so we've had, even though we haven't had a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've had, we have uh, regime changes, that is, um, uh, opposition parties taking over <coughs> power. I think Senegal was uh, is, is, is uh, one of the famous cases. Um, but um, and even Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, um, the same thing happened. What you've been talking about of the um, you know the corruption environment, um, we saw what we saw is that it just continued. That the people that were in opposition and criticizing um, people in power. Um, when they became, when they took power, they sort of went back to those same things that they were criticizing. And so I was just wondering about your opinion about that and, and, and how can we break this cycle um, eventually? Because I, I, you know, I like the ideas that you're presenting and I like the direction that um, you, you know, you're pointing for Angola. But you know, my worry, and it's, this is not just to you, I think that's to you, but my worry is that whatever these changes in governments happen, the people that just come, they just want to get rich too. And kind of like, you know, um, to, to, to sort of, uh, to sort of, um, um, sort of get rich and protect their future gen generation. So I'm just looking for ideas. I mean, what do you think about this and how we break this cycle and really um, eventually move toward um, positive governance in, in South Africa? That's exactly what I said when I referred to the challenge that I left us. And it is related to the motivations of the individuals. What is the motivation for you being involved in politics? Is power or you have a vision? 
its values or just a control interest? That is the question. And I don't rule out that in several countries, yes, people are just motivated by power. When they reach there, they do the same things that as the others were doing. It's what I said that in some cases, in some cases, it's just metamorphosis. People tend to change, but they don't change as far as behavior is concerned. Now, my view also is that there is a trend of change, general trend of change. Today you can go to Zambia, things are moving. You go to Botswana, things are moving. You go to Cape Verde, things are moving. What is necessary is that this movement continues. And countries like South Africa should not go backwards. Countries like Angola should move. But the main question is motivation. What are the motivations of the individuals? Power or a vision? Build or not build? That's the question. There's a lot of Americans that believe that American intervention in, in many countries in Africa and Asia as well um, has led to us supporting, and you're talking about these powerful leaders <coughs> rather than the institutions because they're convenient for us and they're convenient for their economic interests. How much do you think that's been a force in Africa to say that if the Americans said we will no longer intervene, we will no longer support this government over that government, do you think things would have been differently if we would have acted different? Excuse me, things would have been different if we would have acted differently or ultimately the same result would have occurred? First of all, one of the biggest questions is usually in Africa, the U.S. favors stability over democracy. Yes. yes. Usually. If they have to choose, they choose stability instead of democracy. And most leaders in the continent know about that and they play with that. In the past, they played between the rivalry east-west. Today, as this is no longer there, the question is, whoever shows to be a strong leader happens to have the support of the US. And this is the case of the, the Kagame, for instance. It's the case of Museveni in, 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 in Uganda. In many others, many others. I do think that uh, there should be at least a combination combination. Because also you can't build a democracy without stability. There has to be a certain degree of stability. But there should be a combination. That, and it's because of that I said that when I talk to UF's officials, I said, okay, engage and encourage. Encourage. Movement change. You should not uh, reward just for stability and not push for democracy. There should be a combination. You know, going along with this, the idea of Obama is more uh, giving power, not you know, strong people, but more institutions. How is it working lately in Africa? How is he encouraging this idea so that strong leader can somehow uh, create strong institutions, or the two can go together? I recognize that. Uh, when you talk about U.S. institutions, they act that way. They favor stability. But President Obama, in his speeches, usually tends to favor democracy. That's the speech he made in Ghana, for instance, in which he strongly criticized those strong leaders and advised for the building of strong functional institutions. That's, I feel there is a kind of a dichotomy, or how would I say, that the, the State Department and other officials, in their actions, the embassy favor stability. But President Obama, in his speeches, in his political positions, favors institutions. And I think that the solution, they should move to combine the two, stability and democracy. Do you think the, uh, the Chinese investment is so heavy right now will uh, be forced to help move towards the development of strong institutions or is it reinforcing the old power structures? It reinforces old power structures. The only thing is that, uh, at least in Angola, 
the impact of the Chinese is diminishing, especially because uh, they've lost the reputation, lost the reputation on those infrastructure that they, that, that, that they do. We had a, an example, a, a big hospital that was to be the center hospital of Luanda, the capital. The Chinese built it, and uh, six months after they finished building, it could not function. It had to be demolished. Then reputation has been weakened. And, uh, but today is no longer so much strong as it was in the beginning. But they came very strong, but now it's coming down. In Brazil, you mentioned they're also very strong. Uh, the Portuguese, are they, uh, do they demand more institutional uh, development, or are they happy to, to uh, kind of uh, cuddle up to those in power? The oil sector is dominated by US, Britain, and France. And most of them tend to favor more uh, stability than democracy. The construction business, finance, uh, hotels is dominated by Brazil and Portugal. And in their case, they don't care about what is Angola. They just deal with the top individual and especially also because most of the big Brazilian and Portuguese companies are, how do I say, are linked, meaning the daughter of the, of the president, for instance, has shares in all the banks of the Portuguese. And she has business in Portugal. She is the richest woman in Portugal as well. The Brazilians are the same, that meaning the businesses Angolan and Portuguese, the regime and Portuguese, for, and for that reason, they favor just and sustain the regime. Okay, so there's been a strong economic growth over the past several years. Uh, how has that trickled down to the, the common person in terms of things like, well, just basic social indicators, like maybe even education? Has, has educational attainment improved? Yes, it had an impact. Uh, First is, we can today say that there is no hunger in No hunger. Poverty, but no hunger. Uh, we can also say that even some services, education and health, have spread, although the quality is not good. <coughs> Many, for instance, before 2001, 2002, when we reached peace, the country had only three universities. Today we have more than 20, more than 20 in this 10 years period. Uh, yes, there is some impact, impact, positive impact, uh, especially the middle classes coming up and so on. We didn't have middle class in the world. It's coming up, especially because we came from the, the Marxist system of uh, planned economy in 1992 to a kind of uh, Russian style uh, anarchy, the top members in government taking up everything. And then now they are trying to structure the economy on a more a sustained and regular basis. But I recognize, yes, there is a social impact which is diminishing poverty. Before, before 2002, uh, the rate of the population poor were mo almost 70, 70, 70, 80 percent of the population. Today is about 50. And because of that, we have to recognize, yes, there is a kind of, but a very weak and not solid evolution. Uh, speaking of the daughter of Dos Santos being a business woman, or, or you know, the richest woman in Angola. Uh, my question- Richest person. Person, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, what's your opinion on wealth or being in business and being a politician at the same time? Uh, the tendency in Africa, from my observation, is that um, it is assumed that if you are in politics and you have money, you must have stolen that money from the people. Even if, even if maybe you obtain that money by building, building a business, maybe you, you invest in some stock somewhere. And uh, because of this, what I noticed is that um, 
uh, it's also given us this reputation inside and outside that almost all African politicians are corrupt or, or African politicians who have relatives that are rich may have benefited and failed. And we don't know all the evidence, but we you know we don't know how you know how the wealth was accumulated either. So my question is business and politics, making money and being in politics. How, where, where do we, you know, how, how do we want to portray our leaders who are making money? First of all, I don't agree with the generalization that African politicians are corrupt. No. You go to Cape Verde, they are not corrupt. You go to Zambia, they are less corrupt. You go to Botswana, they are less corrupt. Now, we have countries where there is high corruption. And do we have business people in Angola or not Angola? That's why the question mark comes. By 1991, because we had the central planned economy, there were no business people. Everything was the state. After that, we had still war. Then the country was not growing until 2002. Until 2002, the daughter of the president was not rich. Was just the average individual. And the question is that if she had done real honest business, we should all applaud. And it's normal and it's positive for the country. But the question is, the head of the oil company was the cousin of the president, and they were just channeling from the oil company to buy investment stakes in banks, in in telecommunications and all those things. And I give an example. Uh, a colleague of us was made Minister of Public Works. He was also a general and so on. He became Minister of Public Works. And he was average. As we had the priority of building roads to connect the country because the war had ended, in less than five years he became a billionaire. Could you make it simply honestly in an environment like Angola. That's not possible. <laughs> That's not possible. It's here where I say we have really to, and we have laws against, for instance, ministers doing business with themselves, governor doing business with themselves, and so on. We have laws. But the main question is, unless at the top there is moral authority to force change, you can't. And also the president has assumed himself the philosophy of creating wealth. In a speech for the opening of parliament last year on 15th of October, he even tried to suggest that everywhere, especially when wealth was created here in the US back in 17 plus, 18 plus, it was also by that way. The meaning original wealth has to be created that way and then later on regulate things. That's why things happen because himself believes that that's the way to create national wealth by stealing. <laughs> <laughs> so that confirms the point you must have stolen it. <laughs> what um, sector of the uh, of industries are you looking to say as top priorities? asking for foreign investors to come in and how well prepared is the, the workforce for some of these industries that you're going to suggest or, or say would be the top priority. Tech, if, if the education is not currently there, or education educated public is not currently there for the tech sector, then what are some of the other industries that you're looking at? Yes, we have a problem of skills. Lack of skills. It's true that during the last few years, because of the European crisis, we have plenty of Portuguese youth, skilled people, coming in. Some as teachers, doctors, engineers, and so on. As I said also, in the last 10 years, we have moved from three universities to more than 20. More than 20. Also, as I said, schooling has spread across the country. They are building schools every year, plenty of schools being built and so on. What we need to do is also to care about the quality, quality of, so, of learning. Once I spoke with the Minister of Education, a friend of mine, and we discussed about that problem of quality. His view was 
At this moment, what we have to do is just spread quantity. And then later on, move on to look after the quality. I said that, why can't we combine, spread, and ameliorate the quality? This is the problem. Those who come to invest face this problem of lack of skills and also some rigidity in allowing people with skills to come from abroad. Even now companies have difficulties getting work visas, getting all those things. It's a huge problem because you don't find skills there, but also you have backlogs and problems in bringing in skills. Is there something um, in place to say within the next three, five, seven years that uh, you're looking to uh, graduate, uh, say, 1,000 or 10,000 in the tech sector or something along those lines, when you just indicated that you're looking at get the quantity out. We just get uh, a four-year degree in all of the different disciplines, as opposed to focusing on the ones that you're uh, mainly want to attract. Uh, <clears throat> our wish is that because the Angola Nile Company has been sending thousands abroad to study abroad. In Houston, we have plenty of people who came from with scholarships of the oil company, Angola Nile Company, the Southern Gulf. Also, the Ministry of, of Oil has also a policy of sending thousands abroad. We have the Institute of Scholarships, those who sending. I hope that as those abroad start coming back, and then enter into the system, education, health, and business, and so on, since maybe we'll start improving. We'll start improving. So, um, I have a question about the African Union. Um, with the recent conflict that we've seen in the region, what do you think is, um, should be the role of the African Union going forward, and how do you see Angola uh, uh, fitting into that picture and, and, and supporting all, I don't know, uh, I don't believe on our continental organization, the African Union. I don't believe on our sub-regional organizations. I was myself a founding member of the African Parliament, and I don't believe that part. Why? Because most of our regional institutions, instead of following maybe the, the way the European Union was created, value-based, our organization is driven by objectives. How can you have a functioning African parliament in which you have non-elected Libyan parliamentarians, for instance? In which you have non-elected Ugandan parliamentarians and you have elected Ghanaian parliamentarians? The, the, the value is different. How will you achieve those objectives if start by a, a different value base? It's why the best thing should follow, should, 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 should be to follow, and we discussed that in the African Parliament. Okay, the rule should be, be first democratic, have a good governance, and then you join the organization. If you don't have those values, you don't respect those principles, you will not be part of the organization. Because being all part, they just establish objectives, you can't reach those objectives. Uh, Speaking of the democratic values, I used to believe in democracy. Uh, looking at the changes in Africa and even around the world today, what we notice is that, uh, like the, the question, you know, what do the people want? Most of the time, the answer is peace and bread. Um, we look, we take a look at uh, China, for example, an emerging nation today. Um, China hasn't been exactly democratic uh, from its history up to now. There is stability, but um, you know, democratic values have not been uh, uh, asserted. And here, uh, it's a nation that is a global, a global player. Um, in, in Africa, the West have promoted democracy a lot uh, after the fall of the war of Berlin. However, my observation is that it is a democracy that only that is accepted only when it favors a certain Western power. Uh, I recall speaking an, an example: an elected leader, after a constitutional court decided that leader is the true winner, was removed by bombs, and someone else imposed on the nation through a process that also led to an ethnic cleansing. 
So the question is, can, should we really, should, do we still have something left to even believe in the idea of democracy as anything worthwhile? Or should we settle for the stability and economic growth instead? Well, I'll take uh, what said uh, Churchill. Churchill said that uh, democracy is very bad, but no one invented something better. Now, <clears throat> if you are hungry, probably democracy will not matter too much to you. But as you move on on the hierarchy of needs, some of those basic needs, food, safety, health, and so on, you will need freedom. So I think that uh, we should not discuss if democracy is good or bad. We should discuss how to implement democracy in a better way. How to implement it? This should be our main discussion. That's the way I see, I see things. It's, as I said already, this question of Cote d'Ivoire. In the region, this region, most of the countries really are not yet really independent from France. Not yet really. First is that you rely on the military of France for your own security and safety of the country. You did not succeed to build your own, maybe with the exception of Nigeria. But the French-speaking countries, all of them depend heavily on France. And you cannot be an independent country in that situation. We in, in Southern Africa, at least in Angola, with the plenty, thousands of Cubans. So South Africans used to come. America gave us, gave us stingers and structures and so on. The Russians were there. But we got rid of all of that. Today we have our own institutions. So not to depend as in this region of West Africa. Yes, uh, I'm going back to the uh, point of skill utilization. We know we in Africa sometimes we find people are uh, highly educated, they have good companies, but if you compare, let's say a company from Western countries, United States, UK, and an African company on the same job, an uh, American company will perform very well, but an African company of the same staff with the same skill we perform poorly. Even if that person were educated in the United States. But when it comes for the execution of the actual job, we find things are quite different. So you find that most of the jobs are being taken by outside companies. But we have higher educated people, we have companies in place. This has been happening in Tanzania. Now I want just to give us the ideas what is just happening with those companies because if we say we need skill migration. We have also on our side to show that we can manage things. But if we cannot even manage things, that means all of these jobs, big jobs, construction, and mining will be taken by outsiders. And you can't even comprehend that individually, we are not growing, as the professor was saying there, on a normal level, how the wealth is being distributed it depends also on how you are performing with the jobs. I don't know what's the situation in Tanzania, but uh, in Angola at least, and maybe some other countries in, the, in our region, the problem uh, is excessive, excessive partidarization of the life of the country. I don't know if I'm making it clear. Meaning that party politics are too much involved in the life of the individual. And in our case, you can have good skills. They may even hire you, but it will be a fictitious. You are there to you have your salary, but you don't do your job because people see you as being linked with the parties which are not in government. My son has finished his master's degree. He has to find a job, but he will suffer because his father's opposition. Even oil companies also discriminate that way. This is one of the big issues as far as skills utilization in our country. But I do not know the reality in other countries. But I feel that in many other countries also, that's the same. 
regarding the scales in Africa, you know, our, our post-colonial education system was not set up to allow Africa to have a scale, to, to have a scale for, you know, you, you, you go to school to learn things like sociology, history, geography, you don't build cars with cars or shapes with that, you know. So my impression is that uh, even our own education, we had to evolve in a way that it seems that it is kept the way it is for a reason. And, you know, it's just an opinion. It's not an opinion, it's a reality, even in our country. And I see, for instance, the same in Senegal. Senegal has five highly skilled people, plenty, plenty, but in which fields of skill. And we have been discussing this in a while. We are in a phase of reconstruction of a war. If, if you move from war, what do you need more as far as skills are concerned? You need engineers, you need electricians, you need the carpenters, you need those people who will build economics and those things. But in all of our universities, you will go there and find, okay, there is psychology, there is, there is sociology, there is history, there is law, there is whatever, and you find, you ask, okay, engineering, there is no engineering. No. Medical doctor, there is no. Then, then you, you end up creating skills which are not applicable to your needs and the needs of the market. Then what you do? The engineers have to come from Portugal. The electricians have to come from Portugal. Because you are not creating what you need. We are trying to see if we can reverse that in Angola. But we have also this problem that, yes, plenty of lawyers, plenty of uh, sociologists, plenty of psychologists, plenty of history, but the lack of engineers, lack of technicians. <laughs> the talking profession. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a good opportunity.